Uh, it's great to be here with you guys today, and uh, I hope everybody for the next hour and a half truly takes advantage of, uh, of, of what we have in store for you guys. So, um, so for 36 years, Larry Gelwick served as the volunteer head coach of the Highland rugby team. The team's success, which has produced a varsity win-loss record of 418 wins and just 10 losses in those 36 years, including 20 national rugby championships, caught the attention of Hollywood, which produced a major motion picture entitled Forever Strong, which tells the true life story of Coach Galwicks and the Highland rugby team. He was also the feature of a 2012 documentary entitled Larry Gilwick's No Regrets, which won an Emmy Award for Best Documentary. Much of the national media have labeled Coach Gilwick's as the winningest coach in America. Coach Gilwick's received his master's degree in organizational communications from Brigham Young University. Professionally, Larry's career has been centered in the airline and travel industry, including time as the CEO of an airline, and co-owner of one of the largest travel companies in the country. He currently serves as Vice President of Morris Columbus Travel in Bountiful, hosts a syndicated radio talk show, and is recognized and is a recognized voice in leadership and management coaching. A popular convention and meeting speaker, Coach Gelwicks has addressed conferences and seminars all across the country and around the world on the dynamics of leadership developing winning strategies and attitudes, and championship companies and schools staffed by championship people. His appearances, corporate coaching, keynote speeches include the likes of McDonald's, American Airlines, the IRS, <laughs> Banana Republic, The Gap, uh, British Hotel Owners Association, financial and investment companies, university commencements, and college and professional sports teams. In 2018, Coach Galwicks was asked to spend a weekend with the Houston Astros, who had just won the 2017 World Series. He was asked to coach their players on developing and maintaining a winning attitude on and off the field, and was the keynote speaker at Major League Baseball's annual meeting and convention. Please help give a warm security national welcome to Coach Larry Galwicks. It's really been interesting when the movie opened in theaters, Coast to Coast, um, a whole new career for me started, and that is speaking to groups like this. The largest group I've spoken to was 10,000. The smallest was 13. That was a really interesting one. It was an international computer hardware company uh, headquartered in Chicago, and it was the CEO and his officers. Uh, that it's been a wide range, but I noticed some chuckles when they mentioned the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. I actually spoke to them twice, and when they asked me about the fee, I said, no audits for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't go for that. I actually said that to them. Um, Scott, I'll give you the guy's number, maybe we can work something out. It, you know, it's a real, it really is a pleasure to be here. I have had the privilege of being associated with Security National for, my gosh, 12, 13 years. Some of you I've seen riding elephants in Thailand, others of you lounging around the beach of the pool in Maui. And uh, it, it, it's a warm, it's a warm relationship. The movie Forever Strong did very well coast to coast in theaters, and it went on a big international run. Now, I want to tell you something about rugby, because we are now in football season. You got that, Jason? All right, here we go. Um, did you know that football is the child, the offshoot of rugby? You see, in football, you're running down the field. It's a tackle sport. You cross that imaginary goal line and score a... What do they call? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> you score a touchdown. All right, there's your six points. You played a lot of football without a helmet, didn't you? All right, all right. And then you, you kick the ball through the goalpost. There's your seven points with the field goal. There's your three points. Well, 
I can't say that a rugby ball looks like a football because rugby came first. A football looks just like a rugby ball. It's a full contact tackle sports, but no helmets. I played without a helmet too, and no pads. And so you're running down the field, you cross the goal line, but you haven't scored. To score in rugby, you have to ground the ball or touch it down. Hence the word touchdown. That's where the football turn comes. And then you kick the ball through the goalpost for your seven points. In rugby, we have a, a kick like a field goal, three points. And so uh, there's so many similarities between the game. What I'd like to do now is let's jump into the trailer of the movie, Forever Strong. experience having the movie uh, reflect your life. Uh, all of the stories and all of the characters in the movie are true. That's one thing I insisted upon. There's some Hollywoodization. Do you remember that one scene where the main character, Rick Penning, he's up against the fence and they're playing and it's snow on the field? Do you remember that one? The film, the movie is actually filmed here in Utah because uh, the Utah Movie Commission gives so many tax credits and things to uh, companies, so it's filmed here. It was in July. Now the snow out there was actually potato flakes, and I kept thinking, you know, if it rains, we're gonna have mashed potatoes everywhere <laughs> on the field. Well, listen, uh, it was a great run for 36 years. I was the volunteer head coach. What doesn't come through in the movie is how big the team was. We had over 200 players on the team, grades 7 through 12, 15 coaches, all of us volunteers, and uh, six different age grade teams. Uh, there was a high commitment. It was a tough program, but it was a rewarding program. And the kids made an absolute commitment to excellence. We practiced every day after school. And uh, they were lethal on the field. Absolutely lethal. Now, the question that 
Jason asked me and Marty asked me as we talked about the privilege of spending some time with you. And the question that I've always asked this coach, come on, 418 wins and just 10 losses in 36 years, 20 national championships, and you're graduating kids every year. How do you stay at the top of your game? Well, there's a couple things I learned as I started looking at championship teams, championship players, championship companies. You know what I found out? I saw in my 36 years of coaching a lot of really good players, a lot of really good teams and coaches. But I only saw a handful of great players, great coaches, and great teams. And I started asking myself, what's the difference between good and great? How do you stay at the, at the top of the game? Well, I noticed that great teams and great players have a laser-like focus on their goals. Now, sometimes you have to call it audible. The market conditions change, the game changes, and you have to adjust with it. And you know what's a great example of an industry that has not adjusted to changing market? How about shared ride, Lyft, and Uber and taxis? How did the taxi industry respond when Uber and Lyft came in? They whined, they moaned, it's unfair, and they asked the government to step in and regulate them, as opposed to changing to different market conditions. Championship players have a laser-like focus. Now, you got to start with good players. I mean, come on, you can't have a bunch of clowns tripping over your shoelaces. But what I learned that 200-plus players that we had every year, they weren't a bunch of Heisman Trophy winners. But they were put into a system where they could grow and develop. Perhaps the greatest quarterback in NFL history, some people would say, is Tom Brady. Now you can say whatever you want about inflating a ball, but that man knows how to win, doesn't he? Uh, he was drafted 199. What was it, at the end of the sixth round? 199. But he was put into a system with coaching, with resources, with relationships that allowed him to win, what, six, seven Super Bowl rings. Perhaps the greatest coach uh, right there. So I think one of the keys that I've had, a laser-like focus in a system that allows them to grow and a work ethic that will not quit. Let's talk about moving from good to great. When the team is winning, when the company is profitable, we're making some sales goals, that's good. And do you know what the biggest obstacle for a sports team for security national for an uber or a lyft for any industry the biggest obstacle of moving from good to great is when we're good we don't feel what must be a positive in enabling pressure not a not a negative not a diminishing pressure that will destroy people and destroy companies let me tell you what i mean by great Great is not a comparative virtue. I'm not great compared to you or you to me. I'm great compared to myself and my potential. Am I growing in my profession here at Security National? Is my family growing, be that a family of one or a family of many? So I told you a little bit about rugby. Now the scoring is very similar to football, isn't it? So if, if uh, you don't see the Rose Bowl, and you hear that Utah beats Ohio State 27-10, take that for Vegas as a prediction. Uh, you kind of you know how the game went, don't you? Well, in rugby, it's the same way. So we're playing our arch rival, our biggest rival, Skyline High School. Now on the field, we don't like these guys. I mean, we really don't like this stuff. <clears throat> Off the field, we're just fine. But once, it, once it's game time, it's strap it on, boys. And we beat them 42 to 6. I mean, we beat the snot bubbles out of these guys. All right? 
And we're in the locker room afterwards, and the guys are all jumping around. They're excited. And I talked to them after the game, and I said, first of all, fellas, congratulations on a great win. I mean, come on, 42 to 6. And congratulations on a league win. It's not just our rival, but we're in the same league. And they're all excited and everything. And it's just a physical game. And I said, fellas, how do you think we played? And they said, Coach, we killed those suckers. Yeah, I said, yeah, we really did. But that was not my question. My question was, how did we play? Did we follow our game plan? Or at halftime, did we put it on cruise control and the game was really out of reach? They thought for a minute, said, yeah, we put it on cruise control. We just coasted through the second half. Both teams knew it was, you know, it was over. And I said, listen, fellas, I don't want to take anything away from this win. It's a great league win. But I can't begin to tell you how disappointed I am in you, in this team. It, we didn't do our best. It's not about beating up another team. We don't want to embarrass anyone, boys. We don't want to run the score up to run the score up. But I don't want you learning a lesson of life that you can just skate by with the minimum effort and be comfortable and be good. Because you will take this throughout your life. That's moving from good to great. And good and great, is the first measurement is us. Where are we? Are we taking on more? Are we just comfortable? Are we complacent with, with where we are and our lifestyle with where we are? Now, once we, we have that understanding of we have a commitment that I, starting with me, you see, it's never about the other team. It's not about Skyline. Jason, it's not about your competition uh, in, 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 in any of the security national businesses be it the cemetery, the mortuary, and sure, what, it's not about competition. It's about me. It's about us. And that is going to be our focus today. And I'm going to share with you some of what I've shared with professional sports teams, Fortune 100 companies. So what I want you to look at is after we have a laser light focus, after we have a commitment, am I okay here, Sarah? We have a commitment uh, of moving from good to great. Once we have good people, may not be Heisman Trophy winners, but we are going to move in that direction. I, as I studied champions, I came up with five championship strategies. The first is we, not me. It's about the team. The second is don't play with snakes. Uh, I wish we had time to talk about this one. This is an absolutely hysterical story about one of my players when he was 14. Went out in his garage and found a rattlesnake. He knew what it was. He picked it up with play them and played with it. And then it's like, it bit me. Like, no kidding. You know, what did you think was going to happen? And we talk about, it's a much longer discussion, we define rattlesnakes as something in our life. It could be our personal life, our family life, with a spouse or partner, uh, and, and a professional life. There's something that's not right. We know what it is. We know it's not right. It could be a behavior. It could be an attitude. Whether it's legal or illegal is totally irrelevant. There are things that are not right that are legal. Maybe it's an attitude about business. It doesn't even touch legality. We know what that attitude is. We know it's not right, but we want to hold on to it. The third is where we're going to focus today. Attitude and effort, the muscle of resilience. I really enjoy this one. Expect to win. We'll be talking about that, and I'll tell you what that means. It's not what you think it means. And that this is, I've done so many coaching clinics here and overseas in sports, and this, this, this is it. We always keep our focus on the final score. How do I get myself 
how do I get my team to the end of the game to get them where I want them to be? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing more on number three, and we're going to touch on four and five. Now, later today, you're going to leave this building. I want a laser light focus right now. You're going to leave this building. There is a question that every one of us is going to answer. You will answer this question. And if you don't cognitively or affirmatively answer the question or consciously, your non-answer becomes your answer. And here's what it is. As a result of my presentation, Jason's presentation, and the rest of the day, the interaction that you'll have with each other and those reflective moments, will you leave this room and this building having been changed or just merely entertained? And you know, if you're just entertained, well, that's okay, I guess. So what? You know, look at your, look at your cell phone. There's so several million ways you can entertain yourself. But unless we are changing... Uh, you've come from all over the country. Unless we are making those changes to move from good to great, to take on more, to, to excel and grow, so what? Why are we even here uh, today? You know, I remember uh, Banana Republic. I spoke to them. National Sales Conference with all their managers and salespeople. Um, and it was, it was a great event. They held it in San Francisco. It was a few years ago before the pandemic. And I remember when Banana Republic called me and they said, we want you to motivate our salespeople. And I said, motivate them to do what? You see, you can't have motivation in isolation. Motivation must be tied to a behavior. What do you want? They said, we want you to motivate them to sell more. I said, I can't do that. Can't do it. And they were kind of stunned. And I said, I can come and talk to them. I can give them the tools. I can give them the game plan. But I can't go out and sell for them. And it was like a click, click. They were asking me to come in and do some whiz bang hour and a half talk and suddenly they're sailing and I said it doesn't work that way why do you think we go through two a days in sports why do you think we practice every day so that so that we learn to react instinctively and not just out of a playbook I said I, I can't motivate them to increase their sales it has to come from them but I can give them the tools I can give them the game plan so today we're going to focus on takeaways what do I take away that I can put into place to increase my productivity, my satisfaction, my job uh, performance, my sales, profitability for myself, and profitability for Security National? That is the takeaway. Um, so we're going to talk, I mentioned number three, attitude and effort is the muscle of resilience. This is a very different definition than perhaps you've had before. Because when we think of resilience, Stephen, what, do we, what comes to mind? Have we succeeded or failed when we say you've got to be resilient? To me, resilience just means the ability to kind of take the challenges and the punches that come through daily life. Amen to that. What, what Steve said, he was telling me, weren't you, uh, down, you're from Louisiana, aren't you? You were in flip-flops yesterday, weren't you? Right. There you go. Now he comes to a foot of snow. Welcome to Utah. Uh, but what, what Stephen said was, it's like you learn to take the body punches and the, you know, the blows that come in life. That is absolutely part of it. And that's the, the general understanding of being resilient. But I have a very different definition, Steve. To me, resilience is taking any outcome good or bad, success or failure. I make the sale, I don't make the sale. I'm turned away, I'm invited in. We take any outcome and use it as jet fuel 
for future opportunity and success. And that's our folks that you, your sales are good. What are we taking from those sales so that we don't get complacent? We don't put the game on cruise control like my team did. And we use it now to propel ourselves in the hyperspace. Or, hey, it's been a rough couple of weeks. What do we learn from that? What do we take from that so that we now find success? That is our definition of resilience. I have four types of resilience. I'll mention them here. We'll talk more about them later. We have resource, using the helps, the resources, the guidebooks that are available to us. Relationships, you know, uh, those are the people around us. For those of you uh, in pre-need or in final expense, you know, you look at the resources that you might have. Maybe it's Todd or Tommy or Guy or Jason, or Scott. Who are the people that I can help put my career into hyperspace? Uh, oops, I went hit the wrong button there. Let me go back here. All right, I'm having all sorts of problems. All right, uh, street smarts. Now, this, let me tell you. Uh, look at Scott. Look at me. What do you notice that we have in common? A lot of gray hair. I call it uh, gray smarts. I really do. It's gray smarts. There are things in life that you only learn through time and experience. There's no book learning for this stuff. That is street smarts. It's moxie. You just you just pick this up as you go, and and that's why. For those of you who are new into this with Security National. Find a mentor, find mentors, men and women who can pass on years of experiences of success and failure. And the last, of course, is rock bottom. We all know you've hit rock bottom. Some people say there's only one way to go. Some people go up, some stay down, dig a hole for themselves, uh, become a victim and blame everybody else. And so we'll be, talk we'll be uh, talking about those. Attitude and effort is the muscle of resilience. And in my view, in 36 years of coaching and a long business career, attitude and effort is everything. Now, let me define attitude. It's a state of mind. It's not a belief like I believe in, in, a, in this, I believe in God, I believe in country and apple pie. No, an attitude for our definition is an emotional or psychological place where we see ourselves, where we see our environment, where we see our job situation. It is a state of mind that absolutely controls our performance. And I'm not suggesting it's a bad state of mind. I think the fact that you're here, it's really good attitudes. Now we want to move from good to great. Um, we talk about attitude change. I'm just going to tell you something. I think we have it all wrong. I really think we have it all wrong. Because, I mean, all of us have had this experience. Hey, Larry, you need to change your attitude. If you gentlemen are married, you can get it three or four times a day, don't you? <laughs> you know what bugs me about that? My wife, Kathy, just bugs me. She's right. <laughs> She's always right. Uh, Larry, you need to change your attitude. It's like this. Oh, yeah, I need to change my attitude. Just a minute. Uh, I don't feel that way anymore. Wasn't that easy? Well, isn't that the biggest crock of baloney? I mean, I can fake it, but nothing really changed. I have learned through my entire business career and 36 years of coaching over 3,000 players, <coughs> We can change our attitude, our state of mind, our emotional or psychological place. And there is one way and one way only to do it. You want to change an attitude, we must first change a behavior. Attitude change, that state of mind, that psychological, emotional place, 
will follow behavior change, never the other way around. And so this carries through, maybe some of you have children or grandchildren, and there's a state of mind, a feeling, an emotional or psychological place that you would like to see improved with your children. Was it that? Stop nagging them. I mean, yes, we have boundaries. Yes, we have rules. But help them identify a behavior that has to change. School sucks. I hate school. Well, okay. Rather than say, well, you're not going to, you know, you'll be a bum for the rest of your life. <laughs> help them identify a behavior. Where do you think you are in your ability to increase your sales 10%, 20%, 50%, X percent? What is your state of mind? What is the behavior that has to change first? That's how it comes down, is that the behavior is what will follow. Um, by the way, you don't have to like the behavior either. Believe it or not, excuse me, that was my face maker. <laughs> <laughs> I put a new battery in <laughs> No, you don't have to like the damn Believe it or not, I exercise. You wouldn't know it by looking at it. Stop laughing, Jason. Uh, uh, but I'll go out and run, usually three or four miles, three or four days a week or something. If I tell myself I'm going to go run four miles, I'm telling you it will not happen. I'd rather be sitting on my fat rear end eating pizza and watching a ball game than just about anything else in life. I see, Steve, you're nodding your head. You're with me, brother. Okay, but I go out. Now, I played organized sports in high school and college. I played ball down at BYU. And they always talked about this exercise high in the weight room or running. What a crock that was. You know, I, I never, you know what I mean? I never got the exercise high. I hated every minute of it, but I did it. So I'll go out running, and you know what I do? I say, I'm going to run to the stop sign. That's all I'm going to do. I get to the stop sign, I'm going to run to the lamppost. I get to, I'm going to run to the big tree, I'm going to run to the greenhouse. Before I know it, I've run my three or four miles. I've broken it up into segments. I still don't like the behavior, but I like the results. You know, men do this. Ladies, you don't do it, but men you get out of the shower and you look in the mirror. <laughs> ah, yeah. You know, Kathy looks at me. Oh, yeah, and all that stuff. <laughs> in, my, in my dreams. But, um, uh, you know, I like the results. And what the results do is it reinforces the behavior. That is now my fuel. That's what's feeding me. Now, I want to take you back to August of 2009. I'm sitting at my desk. The telephone rings. And, uh, hello, this is Larry. A familiar voice comes on the other end. He says, uh, uh, hello, coach. This is Bronco Mendenhall. At the time, he was the head coach of the BYU football team. <laughs> then left and went to Virginia and did very, very well back there. And I said, well, hold back to you, coach. How can I help you? And he says, in less than two weeks, we are leaving to open the season on the road against Oklahoma. They're ranked number three in the nation. Sam Bradford was the All-American. Remember Sam Bradford went on to a great NFL career. He was the All-American quarterback that was just cutting up the NCAA. Great quarterback. He says they're ranked number three, and most people think they are ranked too low. They should be one or two. And he said, um, we're going to be on the road, and we have players that don't believe we can hang with the Sooners, don't believe we can win, and it's spreading like a cancer 
amongst the team. He says, we have given this team every pep talk that we can. By the way, as a coach, pep talks have a very short effectiveness. They have no long-term uh, effectiveness. They don't turn results over the long. It's a short, it's like an, an adrenaline shot, you know, an EpiPen right in the heart. And that's good for about 30 minutes. That's it. But we give them because, you know, right before we go out, the last thing I used to, there's two things I used to say to the team before we take the field. One is it doesn't matter who scores. It only matters that we score. And then the last thing, go out, hit them so hard, you make them cry. That's how we went out on the field. But so back to B. White, he says, he said, we've given every pep talk. And he says, would you come down and talk to the team? I said, I'd be happy to. A few days later, I'm down in Provo, Utah, in the football meeting room. It's kind of a tiered theater style. And um, I'm talking to the team, and I, I review with them a study that was done by the New England Patriots about 20 years ago. At the time, the Patriots were a good team, but not a premier. I mean, they really are an elite, an elite group. Uh, as I've said, you can say what you want about Belichick or Brady, but those guys know how to win, all right? And, the, and they said, we want to look at 20 years of film. Why do we win? Why do we lose? Now, you take the blowout, you push them aside. They wanted to look at the games in play. What does in play mean? Eight points or less. Because it's one score. It's a one score game. Anything can happen right down to the final whistle. There can be a pick six, a penalty, uh, an injury, uh, the wind condition, the crowd, the noise. Anything can happen right till the final whistle. Why do we win and why do we lose? You know what they found out? Is that every win or loss came down to four or five plays. Four or five plays determine the outcome of the game. Now, what's the good news? Well, we know that the ball game, BYU, Oklahoma, or any is going to come down to four or five plays. What's the bad news? Yeah, what is it? You don't know. When. You don't know when in those four or five plays. You know, I also was a volunteer varsity football coach, and maybe some of you can see it. You know, we we teach players. Like this, you're on one of these drills. You're like this. You're moving up. You're moving back. Why are we? Why are we on our toes and not our heels? Because if you're on your heels, the game and life and sales and security national is going to blow right past you. You are waiting for them to come to you. But if you're on your toes, you think how many ball games a team would love to have one or two plays back. Think of some of your sales calls. Gee, I wish I could do that again. You know, I had an opportunity and I didn't reach out and grab it. He asked me that critical question where I could that I could close the sale right now, and I just I, I wish I could answer that differently. Well, that's great, smarts, isn't it? We learn. Sorry, Stephen. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's that's great, smarts. We learn from our experience. So I'm talking to BYU about three or four plays there. The other thing the Patriots found out is that the most critical players to the game were not the Heisman Trophy winners. They were players drafted four, five, and six, and seven. Brady, 199th draft, and the, the last player picked in the sixth round. Now they go to the seventh. Those are the players that make the difference. Maybe some of you are Heisman Trophy winners coming into Security National. My guess is most of us, starting with myself, are in that round four, round five, round six. But you have an opportunity, we have an opportunity to be in a system with coaches that allows us to grow here at Security National and take on more and we're going to get rid of that complacency. Well then I got so I then I said I said to the team now and I talked to them about how behavior has to change. So I got I think Max Hall was the quarterback 
and uh, offense, uh, uh, the quarterback and, and uh, the one of the captains, I got him down and the defensive captain. And I said, listen, fellas, there has to be a change. There has to be a change today starting in practice. Now, I hadn't told Coach Mendenhall what I was going to do. His eyes got, what are you doing to my team? He was sitting there in the back, and I said, I said, the game with Oklahoma is going to come down to four or five plays. And you've got to be on your toes. But what you have to do is change that mindset by changing a behavior. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and practice today. And I want you to slap them shoulder pads, hitting each other on the backside. I want you to grab a face mask like this and say, is this the play? Is this the play? Is this one of those four or five plays that's going to change this game? Well, they went down about 10 days later. They beat Oklahoma. Nobody came to chance. 14-13. Now, I'm not so naive or egotistical to think that my talk was what changed the game. I'd like to think maybe it was part of it. Let's fast forward to the spring, March of 2016. I'm sitting at the uh, Salt Lake Airport. Now, Tom, can you help me with something? Just stay right there. All right. Tom Nicholas, I want you to stare at me, and I'm going to move back and forth wherever I go, just a real stare. Have you ever been out in public? I'm sure you have. And all of a sudden, you just turn to a total stranger, and you, you have that eye lock, and you quickly go down to your magazine, and like this, what do you do a few, uh, just a few moments later? What do you do? He's still looking at me. <laughs> so you're turning the page, you're reading your newspaper. What do you do again? He's still looking at me. All right, that's enough. You're totally creeping me out right now. <laughs> Anyway, so then I'm sitting in the airport, and this, this guy is just staring at me. And then he stands up. He's about six foot seven, had to weigh at least three bills. And he's walking at me, and he's not smiling. And, then, and he has that fixed stare at me. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, he's going to beat me up <laughs> right here in the airport, smash and grab. Right there, it's all the airport. And then he, as he gets closer, I'm going, oh, jeez. He breaks out to a smile, I think, well, okay, I'm going to live. And he's like this. He's looking down at me. And I'm looking up at him like this. He goes, are you the famous rugby coach? First time he was asking. But I said, well, I don't know how famous, but I did coach for 36 years. Well, are you the forever strong? rugby coach in the movie and I said yes he says I always wanted to find you thank you I said for what have we met he says kind of but not really not individually he says you came and talked to our football team before we played Oklahoma said, you were on the team sit down he sits down. I'm still talking to him. <laughs> I've been short most of my life. Uh, <laughs> and I talked to him, and, and, and he says, you know, we didn't think we could be no home. But we took what you said, literally, and we went out in practice, and we were pounding on shoulder pads. We were grabbing face masks. We were slapping backsides. And everyone said, because I told them, every time you break the huddle, is this the play? Is this the play? Every time you break the offense or defense, the O and D huddle, is this the play? Is this one of these plays? Because if you knew that play was coming, boy, Anthony, you'd be on top of your toes, wouldn't you? He says, we did that. And it was a forced behavior. But after a while, it became instinct. We didn't have we didn't have to think about it. It became instinct. And that's what it is in our family, in a relationship with a spouse or partner. And so important here at Security National. There are things that you have learned. There are things that you will learn today that you have to kind of think about it. But if you keep thinking about it. You use the resources and the relationships that are here and the great smarts that are here at Security National. 
And after a period of time, it will become instinctive to you. Now, I want to show you a video clip. Have any of you seen the movie Facing the Giants? That's a good, that's a good one, isn't it, Sean? Um, Facing the Giants, it's about a high school football team. And they're playing their biggest rival, and they don't think they can win. And the most, the most influential player, the MVP, doesn't think they can win. And that attitude is spreading through it. And the coach is given all of the pep talks that he possibly can, but it's not working. The coach understands that a behavior has to change to change the state of mind. Let's see what he does. So, Coach, how strong is Westview this year? Well, strong we are. You already written Friday night down as a loss, bro? Well, not only we can beat them. Hey, bro. You too, Jerry. What, am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl again, except I want to see your absolute death. <laughs> What, you want me to go to the 30? Just 50. 50. I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. You can do with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, would you promise me you're going to do your best? All right. Your best. Okay. You're going to give me your best. I'm going to give you my best. What's like? You do a lot Why? I want you to give it up at a certain point when you feel further. You know, Jeremy, get on the back. Can you hear that in the back? You talk about All right. Let's go, Brock. Give it use off the ground. Let's your hands and feet. There you go. Go to the left. Go to the left. There you go. Show you that. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. It's a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. That's it, Brock. That's it. Put the 20 yet? Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. Now, don't stop, Brock. You got more to you than that. Hey, Doug. Just rest in a second. You got to keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving. Keep, keep your knees off the ground. That's it. Your very best. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. That's it. Keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving. Don't quit till you got nothing left. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. I want everything you got. Come on, keep going. Cards. Don't quit. Them. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. He's heavy. I know he's heavy. A bite on his strength. And you can go here with your buddies and find more strength, but don't you give up on me, Brock. You keep going. You hear me? You keep going. You do what's good. You keep going. You not quit. You keep going. I know it. You keep going. You keep going. It's all hard from here. 30 more steps. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Keep going. Hey, later, brother. It's all hard. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Come on. Keep going.
ideas that have come to your mind and your heart, write them down as we go through this exercise. Did you notice a couple of things that when Brock starts saying, it's hard, it's difficult, I don't have any more strength. The coach never got personal. My grandmother could run faster than you. He, he, he kept Brock five more steps, ten more steps. He kept encouraging him but never was diminishing, never was put down, never tried any neg. I don't believe in negative motivation. Don't tear somebody down and build them up. It just doesn't work that way. Um, we tried to do that as coaches. We, we were tough. It was a tough program, but it was never personal. When you, <clears throat> when you talk about how to improve, we always came up with that player a game plan. The run is, hey, you got to run faster. Let's talk about the things you could do to run faster. That's resilience. That's using the resources around you to get better. Why do you think that most business plans, sales programs, diets, New Year's resolutions, self-help programs fail? Because we're, we are waiting for that our, our attitude, that mental state of where we are, what we can do to somehow be magically twinkled and changed. So work that way. The behavior has to change uh, first. Now, one of the other uh, is expect to win. Notice how it's spelled. I told you I'd let you know what that means. This falls right into what we're talking about. It's an acronym for what's important now. Um, Look, look at where you are in your family. Be that a family of one or a family of many. In a relationship with a spouse or partner. What do you want tomorrow with your children, grandchildren, with a spouse or partner? Look at yourself. Where do I want to be in six months? My family, the spouse, partner, so where do I, what do I want to evolve in six months? What do I want to evolve in a year, two years, five years? Let's take a look at your professional life here at Security National. You wouldn't be here if you weren't a good, good ball player, you know. But we don't want to. We don't want just good ball players. We have great ball players on this team here at Security National. Why? Where do you want to be with Security National in six months? Where do you want your sales to be? I can't answer. Remember I told you about when the gap wanted to come motivate them to increase their sales? I said, I can't do that. I, I can talk about the skills. We can talk about changing behaviors. But those on the field are the ones that have to do it. Those, in your case, in the field. Where do you want to be in a year, two years, five years? 
Where do you want you? So what what do you have to do today to get what you want tomorrow? It's really simple. I'm telling you things you already know, but now we have a laser light focus. And then what we do, we always keep our focus on the final score. I trust that you have written down security national performance goals. We don't want to just be that we want to bust through it, don't we? You're going to have some wins and some losses, but we want more wins than losses. What do you have to do today to get what you want tomorrow? It's really that simple. It's called the law of the price tag. Now, um, many of you know the story of uh, O.J. Oh, excuse me. I want to show you this first. Vince Lombardi, perhaps the greatest NFL coach, said, it's easy to have faith in yourself and have discipline when you're a winner, when you're number one. What you've got to have is faith and discipline when you're not a winner. In our professional life here, it is when things are going great, isn't it easy to give advice and wax eloquent? But how about when we hit a rough streak? and the sales are not coming in, or a rough streak in our home, in our relationships. It gets really hard to keep the chin up, to stay positive. We start having self-doubts, we start blaming others, and we start making excuses. So the discipline comes more sometimes when we're having that rough streak, but there's so much discipline required when we're being successful. That's what the Astros, they just won, Houston Astros had just won the World Series. They said, Coach, come down and you have two days with our players. We want you to coach them on how to, how to have a championship attitude. Well, many of you know the story of Michael Jordan, don't you? That he was arguably the best basketball player of all time. You know that Michael Jordan was cut from his high school varsity team. Did you know that? Yeah. Michael Jordan, don't have enough talent, go play tennis or something. Well, he had a choice to make. He had a setback. He had an attitude to deal with, a mindset. I have been cut from the thing that I love the most. The coach is unfair. The coach sucks. I'm better than him. All of these things are racing through his mind, and he was asked what he did. His very words were, I put so much wood on my fire. You see, what he did is he focused on the behavior rather than the attitude of, I've been treated unfairly, it's, it's not right, I got screwed, all of these things. He said, no, I'm going to focus on my behavior, and I'm going to show these guys. Now, I want to show you the next video clip. And uh, it's uh, the occasion of Michael Jordan, the kid who was cut from the basketball team, being uh, inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame. Let's see what he has to say. Jackie, uh, watch the sound of this. Sometimes it comes to me. has gone a long way from the first time I picked up any sport. Baseball, football, ran track, basketball, anything in this class, I played uh, when you think about, you know, so they started the fire in me. You know, that fire started with my parents. And as I moved on in my career, people added wood to that fire. Coach Smith, you know, what else can I say about him? You know, he's a legendary, you know, he's a legendary coach. And then there's Leroy Smith. Now, you guys think that's a myth. Leroy Smith was a guy, when I got cut, he made the team, Boston team. He's here tonight. He's still the same 6'7 guy. He's not even bigger. He, his, probably his game is about the same. <laughs> but he started the whole process with me because when he made the team and I did, I wanted to prove not just to Leroy Smith, not just to myself, but to the coach who actually picked Leroy over me. I wanted to make sure you understood you made a mistake, dude. <laughs>
And Coach Smith, day that he was on the Sports Illustrated and he named four starters and he didn't name me, that burned me up. Because I thought I belonged on that Sports Illustrated. Now, he had his own vision about giving a freshman that exposure, and I totally understand that, but from a basketball center, I deserve to be on that Sports Illustrated. And you understand that. And then you had all your media and they say, oh, school can't, we can't win. Can't win an NBA title. But you know, you're not as good as Magic Johnson. You're not as good as Larry Bird. You're good, but you're not as good as those guys. I had to listen to all this. And that put so much wood on that fire that it kept me each and every day trying to get better as a basketball player. Now, I'm not saying they, they were wrong. I may have looked at it from a different perspective. You know, but at the same time, as a basketball player, I'm trying to become the best that I can. And for someone like me, who achieved a lot in the time of my career, you look for any kind of messages that people may say or do, get you motivated to play the game of basketball at the highest level. Because that is when I feel like I excel at, at my best. Oh, oh. Here we are. Let's talk about these just for a moment. Four types of resilience. Resource, which is using all of the helps around us. Relationship, using all of the people around us. Um, street smarts, that's what I call gray smarts. Things that we learn be it whether you're 22 or 62, you've learned things along the road and then rock bottom. Now, I mentioned that I went uh, down and spent a weekend with the Houston Astros. This is one of the things they gave me. You ever see the World Series ring? I like to wear this on occasion when Scott walks up and he says, uh, where's the meeting? I say, well, Scott, it's right <laughs> over there. <laughs> Uh, this is one of my prizes, is a World Series championship ring that they gave me after my two days there uh, with them. I want to tell you about a player. I, I tell you, it was so much fun. I was in the clubhouse with them, out on the field with them, and then I had, and they wanted me to just intermix and talk to them during the day. I ate with them. I got to tell you, these guys eat very, very well. And I had them for two hours each day. The first day we talked about leadership, uh, horizontal leadership and vertical. Vertical, vertical leadership basically is it's the most common type of leadership or management, and it is diminishing. It is counterproductive, but it gets immediate results. It's based upon fear and intimidation. Jason, I want that report. If you don't get it in, you're out of here. I can get you to do almost anything through fear and intimidation, because I need this job. But it's based upon the assumption that you can't do it without me. If you are successful, it's because of me. It's a great coach. If the company's successful, it's a great department and a manager, a CEO, a president. If the team is winning, you know, it's the coach, it's the organization. But if you're losing, it's lazy, messed up players. If, if the company is struggling, there's always this finger pointing. So if we are successful in vertical leadership, it's because of the coach, the leader. And you can't do it without me. You contrast that with uh, horizontal leadership, where it's like I used to say to the players, in terms of human dignity and respect, there is no difference between you and me. But oh, between the, the, the seventh grader and the senior, the junior varsity and the varsity captain, the assistant, there's no difference in terms of human dignity and respect. Oh, but there is a difference. And the difference is our responsibility, our job. You see, I can't win without you and you can't win without me. Let's focus on cooperation with each other here in our team, in our business, rather than competition with each other. So I, I so we talked, second day I talked about how to develop a championship winning attitude. There's this one kid, he's in one of the farm teams, club teams. 
19 years old, just right out of high school the previous June. He was in their farm. He was a catcher. But a very strong kid. I don't think he'd ever shaved a day in his life. But uh, Bill, there you go, was the catcher. He comes up to me at one of the braces and says, hey, coach, can I talk to you? He says, sure. So we just kind of walk off by ourselves. And he says, oh, coach, this has been so fantastic. I've learned so much. I said, well, thank you. He said, how are you doing, son? He says, well, I think I'm doing pretty good, but I'm struggling with a couple of things. He said, what are they? He mentioned some skills. Uh, and I said, what are you doing about it? He says, well, I'm, I'm trying. And I said, well, you have, you have a position coach, don't you? He goes, yeah. Have you discussed these with him? No, no, I could never do that. Well, isn't that what a coach is for? He goes, yeah, but <clears throat> I'm afraid to bring up what I, uh, areas that I'm not doing so well in my deficiencies. Because there is so much pressure here to make it to what they call the bigs. The bigs is, you know, the Houston Astros in Houston, not the farm club in, in Omaha. There's so much pressure and there's so much competition. I'm afraid that if I go to my coach and say, I'm, I don't get this part, I need some help, he's going to look at me and say, what? <laughs> uh, Jason, was that the signal I'm supposed to finish? <laughs> no, I'm watching my time. He, I, I'm afraid he's going to say, hey, maybe he's not our guy. You know, maybe he, maybe we made a mistake here. He says, I, I can't do that. I said, oh, man, you got this bass backwards, don't you? And I said, let's roll a play. So we're just down on the field, this kid and I. I said, well, I'm going to be you. You be the coach. Let's try a different approach. Because you're going to say, hey, I'm having trouble with this or that. Okay. And, and let's, so let's role play. Hey, coach. Hey, it was a great practice today. You know, I just live the dream here. And uh, I really appreciate all the help you've given me. Uh, I feel I'm getting a lot better. There's a couple of areas that uh, I really would like to focus on with, with your help. And just kind of polish it then. Bing, 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 whatever they are. He says, oh, what do you say, coach? And I said to him, now, if you went to your coach with that type of an approach, is he going to think that you were like this? So, okay, now you, you be you and I'll be the coach. And we role-played it back and forth. I said, I promise me to go talk to your coach. I promise. And he did. And it turned out very well. What are the resources and relationships here at Security National? You know, um, many of you are in pre-need and final expense. What are some of the resources and relationships? How about Todd? Tommy? Guy or Jason or a lot of other people. How about your your coworkers? You really think if you walked up to Scott at lunch or something, you saw him in the hall and said, "I got a question for you." Did he turn you away? I know this man. No, no. He, he's going to put his arm around. How can I help you? That's the culture here. Then you're nodding your head. Is that the culture here? It really is. Use the resources around you. Now, let's talk about street smarts and rock bottom. Uh, those of you who follow the NBA remember the mailman, Carl Malone. Now, this goes back a few years, doesn't it? Early in his career, it was actually 1990, he was absolutely the best power forward in the NBA. But how do they pick the starting five for the all-star team, for both teams? It's the fans. They vote. A.C. Green of the Lakers, the Los Angeles Lakers, was voted in in the starting rotation, starting five, as a power forward. Now, A.C. Green's a good ball player, but he was no Carl Malone, and everybody knew it. Why, you tell me, somebody shut up. Why did A.C. Green from L.A. get more votes than Carl Malone in Salt Lake City? <laughs> he was a winner. What else? Look at the population. You know, they're, they're both great ball players. But you look at the population voting in L.A., normally we vote for our local team, don't we? And the, and the population, uh, uh, Chad, here. 
But Karl Malone had a choice to make. He could whine and he could moan about how unfair this was. He changed a behavior. The, the next day, the, not, the next game after the All-Star was announced, the Jazz played the Milwaukee Bucks. And to put an exclamation point on, I because he felt I've been snubbed, I've been disrespected. He went out and scored 61 points against the Bucks. That was how he replied uh, to that. So we're talking about the resources. What we know about resilience, I got it, is that resilience never quits. Now, I want to tell you, we're going to watch one more video. This maybe is my favorite. I want to tell you about Heather Doradin. Heather Doradin uh, was a track star. And this is the Big Ten Women's Championship, 600 meters. That's a long, I mean, that, that is brutal, okay? And we're going to watch this, and I'm going to do some commentary, Jackie, remember, we would do this during this. I'm going to point, let me get the point up so I can show you where she is. Jackie, let's go ahead and roll it, please. Now, this is a home video. Now, when they start, <laughs> turn it down a bit. Turn it up a little bit. Okay, now, they start in, their, in separate lanes. You notice they start at a different place, don't they? After the first lap, it's three laps around the track. Uh, after the first lap, then the lanes collapse, and you can go in any lane that you want. So here we are. Look at the pace. These are the four finalists. They've gone through all of the heats, and now there's the first lap, the lanes collapse. One third of the race is now over. <laughs> now you've got to make a decision. When do I make my break? Do I hang back with a big push at the end? Do I come out too early and burn out? All of these things are racing, and you want to stay in the pack, but at that moment, you want to break out. Well, now they're singly, they're coming up to the end. I want you to watch very carefully because in life, Things don't always turn out the way we want them to. Nobody tripped her. Her clean cut. Look at the separation right here. We have two-thirds of a lap to go. There's the leader. There's the back. There's Heather Dorman. She has a decision to make. Let, is she going to put wood on her fire? And if nothing more, I'll come in fourth and I'll finish. But I'm not going to let something else take me down. She's moved into third place. I'm going to put wood on my fire. She's coming down the final stretch. She actually wins the Big Ten Championships. Amazing. Now, you're going to see some very happy people here. <laughs> I want you to watch here in just a moment. Uh, it's going to go to the uh, time clock. The difference between fourth, excuse me, first and second place we're going to come back to the scoreboard, was four one-hundredths of a second. Four, one, here we go, here we go. 0 0.72, 0 0.76. Now, one second is 1,001. You can have 25 in that 1,001. Now, everybody says, oh, this is unbelievable. Heather Dorgan... <coughs> Tell Donna, you saw the separation, didn't you? And she won the race. I think it's great. To me, that's not the story. The story is she got up and finished. She, you know, if she'd gotten up and, uh, and just jogged over to her bench, would anyone have criticized her? And this, oh, have a tough break. You're right in there. Better luck next time. But she had a choice to make. You have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. She chose to put wood on her fire. She ran into a situation in football. You've seen the quarterback come up. We've called the play, and we're looking over the defense, and we're going to get stuffed. So what does the quarterback do? Calls an audible. We change the play. Market conditions have changed. The economy has changed. People's, people's income, is it, are we in a depression or a recession? Everything can change, and we have to change with that to meet the, the market conditions for that. Now, what I want 
This next part is so critically important. It may be the most important thing that I leave with you, and then briefly, I'm going to put you into an interactive exercise with each other. I want you to watch these next three slides. Maybe the most important thing I can leave with you. Right here. Now, here you are. This is you, or this is your son, your daughter, your spouse, your partner. Uh, this is a client. It could be anybody. This is a goal right up here that we want to achieve. Now, what we do is like a GPS, focus on the final score. You know when you put an address, some of you drove here, maybe you hadn't been to this new building, you put the address in, and it, it tells you where you want to go. But when you hit go or start, the final destination is still listed, but it, it disappears from the screen, doesn't it? What does your screen now say? Uh, three miles on I-15, exit at 53rd South, turn left, turn right, do a U-turn, all of these things. You see, uh, uh, it's like what Stephen Covey says, start with the end in mind. What is my goal? What do I want to achieve? And then what is important now? I want this tomorrow. Tomorrow is tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, five years, 10 years. Uh, but what do I have to do today to get what I want? And so what, there we go. Here is where I think we miss the mark. So often, and you know, be it a child, be it ourselves, our professional, whatever the situation is, we we have we are constantly stressing over this, as important as it is. But once we have the GPS set, once we know what we have to do, what's important now, the single most important thing that I would suggest to you to take into your security national career is right here. What is the next step? We keep the goal in mind, but what do I have to do now today? Now, some people will run up the steps. Some will jog. Some will crawl. Some will go three steps up and two steps back. And some will go two steps up and three steps back. And not everyone will get on the staircase. That's just a fact of life. Not everybody is going to make the varsity team. But everybody in here can. And we have different personalities, different talents. But we're going to learn from the resources of Security National. We're going to learn from the relationships of the people. We're not going to be hesitant to ask for help because we know that everybody has our back. We are not going to be satisfied with complacency. We are not going to be satisfied with good. I'm making enough money. I've got a house. I've got a car. We go on a vacation to wherever. No, I want to achieve more. That's the mindset. That is the, the emotional and psychological framework of where I am right now. So where are you? So here's what I'd like to do. We'll just take a couple of minutes. We've got about 15 minutes left. What I'd like to do is um, have you either just your table or turn around and maybe there's three or four of you wanting to turn around, maybe two tables would even be better. I'm going to give you a question. I'm going to give you a state of mind, a psychological and emotional place that I'm at. As I am in pre-need, I am in final expense, and I know we have some from, uh, what, from Cemetery and Mortgage here also watching it, and thank you for joining us. But, but, what, but I'm going to address this to this group. Here is the question. You know, my sales are going okay, but I'm complacent. How do I overcome complacency? See, this is the attitude. What are the behaviors 
that I have to do to, to escape the prison of complacency. So I need some brave volunteers. The question is, how do I overcome complacency? What is the behavior that has to change? Who will volunteer? Oh, come on. All right, here's, there's two. Uh, this gentleman here, Dale, and then in the back. Mike, right here, Dale. What did you come up with? So complacency means that you're maybe satisfied with where you're at. Could you start out by saying that your sales are okay. So if your sales are okay, you become complacent with that. And you may want to um, reestablish or set a new goal to move you further, reevaluate to make sure that you have reached your current goals. Sometimes we get complacent on um, just what we have, but not what we have set out to do. So what is my behavior, Dale, that needs to change? What is something that I can do to accomplish exactly what you're saying? Okay. So, uh, uh, to really evaluate, to accomplish it, then you some behavior changes is um, to look within, look within yourself. Self-examination. Self yeah, to look within yourself um, to change, to, to make sure that you're reaching goals, to, make, to change some things, the behaviors within yourself, uh, to reevaluate yourself, okay. to set new goals. And maybe, thank you very much, Dale. Let's take the mic to the back. Also, the self-examination. How about asking a trusted colleague, one of the executive sales teams, for an evaluation? You know, that can be revelatory. Go ahead. I'm D.W. Um, we discussed the self-evaluation as well and as it regards to behaviors, but um, with that, we have to look at what is your why and how does that affect your attitude? Thank you very much. Have you enjoyed reading this? Yes. Yeah. Isn't it a great book? Well, yeah. Yeah, because the crowd goes wild. And Jason and Marty were kind enough to give me a book, and I've been reading it with you. And, you know, one of the, the things that Mr. Hardy says is, I love this, this book is about success and what it really takes to earn it. It's time someone told it to you straight. You've been bamboozled for too long. That was in the injury. Remember that part? <laughs> you know, one of the things I learned, you remember talked about when I was uh, there with the BYU football team uh, and with Houston Astros and I've been with Boise State for I don't know, so long with us. I've been with Utah Jazz too uh, coaching them and remember with BYU I said you have to do these behaviors almost forced you write yourself sticky notes, you know, put them up to remind you. But oh, why do we practice so that we react instinctively? And once you, you know, the biggest, I was speaking at the Dean's Convocation of the School of Business up at Utah State uh, pre pandemic. And what I told them there was three things. <clears throat> I said, here's the three things that will destroy good business. <clears throat> Number one, greed. Number two, a big mouth. You do not know the meaning of discretion. And number three is you want to take one swing at the plate and hit a grand slam and be, you know, one of these 22-year-old billionaires that we read about overnight. Well, it doesn't happen that way. What it is, is like in the weight room. You start at one level. You move, you put another plate on, you're moving up. It's small incremental steps. Isn't that the message of that book? Yes, Scott. Go make a sales call. Yeah. Am I waiting for the phone to ring? Am I waiting for them to come and see me? You know, all of these things. I want to show you something here. what I call the accountability ladder. And this is where we are. Think, you know, sometimes those improvements are little baby steps, aren't they? I found the more delights in baby steps. Sometimes they're leaps and bounds on that ladder that we looked at. But on the accountability ladder, 
We're right here. Now, we have accountable behaviors. My focus as a coach is always on changing a behavior. And that doesn't mean for, it might be bad to good. It might be bad to good, good to better, better to best. But right here, we're looking at where we are with security national sales. One of the most important things that can happen is accountability. Now, sometimes as an independent contractor, we have to be absolutely candid. We don't want to be accountable. I'm my own boss. Well, okay, but you're going to be stuck in the loop of where you are. The accountability increases profitability. I promise you that. So right here, acknowledge the reality of where we are, and then don't just accept it, but embrace what the behavior is that has to change for me to be more successful and increase my security national sales. And then find the solution. What's important now? Different clients may have a different path. Focus on the final score, and then nothing good in life happens by wishing, wanting, or hoping. Good things happen by doing. Few good. Rarely is that magic call going to come in. It's going out and making a sales call, and another call, and another call. Or I can become a victim behavior. It's wishing, wanting, hoping. <clears throat> I can't. It's too hard. Personal excuses, I blame others. This is an accountability ladder. Well, let me just wrap up with a couple of things. What is our takeaway today? Our takeaway is that identify a state of mind in our families, in ourselves, in our relationships, because they're all interconnected, and identify a state of mind of where I am in security national sales. Does anyone really, really believe that you're maxed out, you can't possibly make another sale? I'm seeing heads go like this. So what, what is it that has to happen? Are we wishing, wanting, and hoping, or are we doing? You see, I have three types of players. You know, there's over 3,000 that I coach. There are three types of players, and I've found this to be true in life. They're all good people. I loved every one of them. First player uh, wanted to be on the team, wanted to wear the jersey, wear the T-shirt, but you know, he was really comfortable being on the sidelines. He just was comfortable there. But he's part of something great. The second player wanted to be on the field. But he would wait for the game to come to him. The third is what we call a go-to guy, a go-to girl. He says, give me the ball. This is a... Uh, this is a... Um, you know, Steve Young, a Michael Jordan, a Patrick Mahomes, a Tom Brady. And when the game is on the line, give me the ball. Not for selfish reasons, not for glory reasons, but give me that ball because I will get it done. You know, good Lord, I hope that I play today as hard as I have prepared myself for. I can't expect manna from heaven if I have done no preparation. You know? Where, so if I use these type of three, wh wh where am I? Where are you? Comfortable with where we are? And there's no, not a shred of criticism. You know, but are we comfortable wearing the jersey? No criticism. No finger pointing. Nothing belittle or demeaning. Are we on the field? Our business and sales is doing better, but we're really waiting for business to come to us. What are the behavior changes? Become a go-to guy. And remember, greatness is not compared to somebody else. It's compared to me. Remember the Skyline game we talked about? Am I, and, and it's something that we don't just explode to the superstar. We take it in those steps, incremental benefits, and we never confuse activity with results. I can be very busy. You know what I'm gonna be doing tonight? with my grandkids, I'm going over to the Skyline parking lot in our car, strap them in, and we, we spin donuts. Yeah, we really do that. And I'm working, and so the engine is working hard 
but it's not working efficient. It's not working smart. And sometimes I do that. I'm working really hard. I'm really busy. I'm not working smart. Last thought. <clears throat> I have learned in my coaching career, in my business career, and in life, a lot of great smarts and a lot of mistakes along the way. And I've learned from those. I've become resilient through resources, relationships, street smarts, and some rock bottom. I've learned that there's only two types of pain in life. There's the pain of hard work and the pain of regret. Pain of hard work's tough. I mean, because it's so much easier to be casual and get by and just be good. But it, it pushes us. That emotional and physical pressure. And we think we're going to break, but if you've ever had a really hard workout, maybe it's just in, in athletics and sports, physical, uh, piano, academic, whatever that workout is, remember how tough it was? But you remember how you felt when it was over? Sarah, you're smiling. How good we felt, Sarah, when that thing was over because we grew and we got better. Contrast that with the pain of regret. I promise you this. In our personal lives, in our family, or relationships, and in our business here at Security National, if we don't do everything we can to fix and improve whatever needs to be fixed, the pain of regret will never go away. The pain of hard work is temporary. Rewards are forever. The pain of regret is forever. So here we come back to the question. Will we leave this presentation, or more importantly, the whole time here. Everything you learn and feel and hear, will we leave having been changed or just merely entertained? The things we've talked about are true. They work. They work in Fortune 100 companies. They work in international companies. They work in, in any church or synagogue, community or family. And you know something? They really did work on a boy's high school party team. Thank you. God bless.